Hi, my name is Alan Prost, and this is part of the REST 220 Module 4 PowerPoint presentations on modes of ventilation. So, <clears throat> with this short video, what I'm going to talk about is mode of pressure control. We've already talked about this mode a little bit, and we know that it's mostly used as continuous mandatory ventilation and intermittent mandatory ventilation. I'm going to leave out the pressure control with continuous support ventilation for another video. All right, so the key thing about this is that we preset a set pressure that's going to be delivered to the lungs and that's the whole um, point of this mode is that it's quite a bit different from volume in fact with this mode we know that once we set the pressure in the lungs or in the circuit that it's the compliance and resistance that will determine the tidal volume so this mode we're specifically targeting saving pressures and just delivering a set pressure to the lung and this is considered a pressure um, or a lung protective strategy. It can be used with um, CMV and IMV and the point of this is to be that um, we're going to decrease the work of breathing of the patient. Now we can, with IMV of course, we can allow some spontaneous breathing and so we have some variety of control over how much work of breathing a patient is going to be doing. In CMV, the goal is to be to minimize the amount of ventilation a patient is going to do. The, concept behind this mode specifically is that we're going to be dealing with patients with generally low compliance. This is a mode where we really focus on patients with low compliance and we want to do lung protective strategies, often associated with ARDS, which is Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So a big component of ARDS is oxygenation. It's difficult to oxygenate these patients and this can be done more effectively with pressure control ventilation. We can also uh, get better distribution of ventilation because we set up this mode to have an inspiratory pause. So part of that is we're going to have a set pressure and we're going to allow an inspiratory pause and that's going to allow equal distribution of ventilation even in those regions of the lungs that have rather high resistance. So the pressure limit allows us to protect areas of the lung that are um, healthy and we also get precise control over something called the P-plat, or the mean airway pressure. Sometimes mean airway pressure is written such as PAW like this. And that's very useful, and this directly relates back to our oxygenation. With higher mean airway pressures, higher P-plats, we get improved oxygenation. But of course, that can also mean extra damage to the lungs, so we have to weigh this out carefully. So the mode of pressure control, we don't set a flow rate. We don't set a flow rate. It's determined by the patient, and it can be affected by their inspiratory demands. The ventilator does not limit the inspiratory flow, so it's considered to be very responsive to patients' changes in inspiratory demands. If the patient's unconscious, the inspiratory flow is controlled by their lung characteristics or their total cycle time. The disadvantages are that we don't have direct control over tidal ventilation. So we don't have direct control over minute ventilation. Changes in resistance or compliance of the patient, particularly the compliance of the patient, will change our tidal volume. Thus, we don't have good control over the blood gases or direct as direct control over the blood gases as we do with volume ventilation. The resistance doesn't usually change that much because this is really the resistance of the endotracheal tube. The compliance of the lungs, though, can change depending on the disease process. With the phase variables, you know that the trigger can be time or patient triggered, just like with volume ventilation. But where the differences come in is in the limit. It's always pressure limited and it's always time cycled in this mode. Our settings are, of course, the pressure control limit. We set a respiratory rate. We set a TI and unlike with um, volume ventilation, this is not optional. We have to specifically determine how much time and how long that pressure control level is going to be held in the patient's lungs. We always set a PEEP. We set an FiO2, of course, and then anywhere, if we don't know much about our patient, we might set it as much high as 100%. Or if we're not sure, but we think our patient is fairly well oxygenated, maybe something as low as, um, excuse me, that should be written up as 0.6%. All right. And the sensitivity um, we're always set appropriately for our patients. All right. So let's look at these time relationships like we did with volume ventilation. The pressure control level doesn't really alter the time that the breaths are being delivered, but it certainly is an important element of tidal volume. All right. The higher the pressure control level, the more volume will get into the lungs. The rate again determines our total cycle time, just like we did in volume ventilation. So if we've got a a 60 seconds 
and we have a rate of 12, that's going to give us a total time cycle time of 5 seconds. All right. The TI then determines exactly how long the breath or this pressure control level will be delivered. So it's a direct control over TI. Unlike where we established a volume flow relationship, where we weren't sure what the TI would be or the TI total would be, in this mode we know precisely what it is. All right. These two pieces together determine our total cycle time and our TI. So if we say, well, our TI is going to be set at two seconds, our total cycle time is five seconds, that would leave three seconds for exhalation, giving us an IE ratio of 1 to 1 1.5. All right. So that's an important determination because sometimes in this mode, we'll often adjust the TI to give us, say, a 1 to 1 IE ratio. Sometimes we even go inverse and we can have a 2 to 1 IE ratio. And of course, this would have a big impact on our mean airway pressure. So we can manipulate the mean airway pressure without increasing the pressure control level. And that's an important aspect of this mode of ventilation. And of course, the PEEP is a big part of our um, mean airway pressure as well. And we start off with five, and if we have more increasing lung disease, such as with ARDS, we may have to go up on the PEEP, depending on what our oxygen requirements are. So let's look at how this looks. And the important aspects of this drawing and this diagram in here is that I'm going to emphasize the importance of the um, of uh, having a plateau. All right. So we start off with our trigger. All right. So the first thing that happens is the ventilator is triggered. It could be time triggered or patient triggered. The pressure builds up on the circuit very quickly. Now we can use a ramp to ramp in that out a little bit, and then it's going to be held for a period of time depending on our TI. All right. So it's pressure limited. So number two is it's pressure limited. That's our limit. I'm having a little trouble with my pen here. Pressure limited. Okay. Then after the time is held, we cycle into exhalation. All right. So our cycle is always time. Now here what's happening, and this is I want to draw an uh, uh, emphasis on this point here, is that we have truncation of the inspiratory flow. So the flow doesn't get a chance, as it shows in this diagram here, to become down to zero and give us that nice little inspiratory plateau. All right. And that's useful because this in this small little zone in here, that tells us that we have equilibrium between mouth pressures and lung pressures. So we have equilibrium here between the P mouth and the P lung are in equilibrium. All right. Here we don't know. All right. Because this inspiratory flow has been trunc truncated, my pressures in my lungs are building up, building up, building up, building up, building up, building up. But I don't know exactly how much pressure is being at the moment of the lung, in the lungs at the moment we go into exhalation. In this particular zone in here, I've got a decreased time constant. So equilibrium is achieved a little bit quicker. So what's happening here, the pressures in the lungs is building up, building up, building up, building up, building up, building up. But I know at this particular second right in here where I've got that inspiratory pause beginning that the mouth pressures and the lung pressures are equal. All right, and that's very important to note because now this is what gives me the opportunity of good distribution of ventilation. Right in this, when I have that inspiratory plateau, if there's any resistance, that means it's being overcome and I have equilibrium in all zones of the lungs. Here, I may or may not, I don't know, and I don't actually know what pressures are in the lungs at this time either. All right, yes, I'll certainly get a volume back, but what, how much volume depends on how long my TI is. In this case, I could dramatically lengthen my TI and tidal volume would not change. All right. But if I decrease it too much, I can cut off the tidal volume and not have as much delivered. Now I'll highlight that for you. Okay. So the key point about this diagram is that we usually desire to see at least a small inspiratory plateau and maybe longer if I want to increase my mean airway pressure. Okay. So this amount and length of time is determined by the resistance and compliance of the patient. All right. And remember coming back to that concept of the time constant times five. So my dynamic TI should be about five time constants in length. The rise time we're showing here in these diagrams, the pressure basically shoots up almost instantaneously in the circuit. All right, so it builds up very quickly. With the rise time, what we can do is we can actually allow it to take more time to 
develop up to our peak pressure. So decrease that sudden pressure change in the initial part of the breath. And that's going to dampen out our in initial inspiratory flow. Um, some people are big believers of rise times and having them in the circuit. Other people always have them set at zero. We're not sure just how the set rise time up. Okay, so here's our pressure control in virtual ventilators. And I'm just going to highlight again some of the uh, differences that can occur when you have um, an inspiratory plateau. All right. So in this initial case, we've got the pressure control le level set at 25. I've got a TI set for 1.5 seconds. I've got a compliance of 40, a rate of 12. So that gives me a five second total cycle time. All right. I got a five of P point. So pretty basic type settings. All right. Now in this situation, because I've got my inspiratory plateau achieved, so the volume being achieved goes up to 800 and it's held there. So I've got a good inspiratory plateau. In this situation right beside it, I've got the same situation, pressure control 25, all right, but I've dramatically decreased my TI. Still got the rate set the same, got the PEEP set the same, the compliance is the same, the resistance the same, all other factors the same, but notice what happens now here is that the tidal volume is dramatically less. I've got a decreased tidal volume, and that's because I've truncated this inspiratory flow. I've cut off the inspiratory flow before I have my inspiratory pause, and that's going to decrease my tidal volume. I also won't get good distribution of ventilation because as soon as there's still flow and it's just being cut off due to the time. So this time constant here, we're not, we did not allow our time constant times five. We have not allowed that to occur. We're here. We've achieved an inspiratory plateau. Given all factors, I suggest that we set up pressure control to have even just a short inspiratory plateau, and you can increase that or decrease that depending on the needs of your patient, thinking about our mean airway pressure again. All right. So in this circumstance, in the second one here, what's going to happen is if I would have, number two, if I would have increased TI, all right, to more than, say, 1.2 seconds, I would get an increased tidal volume, all right? But if I go long, too long a TI, all right, my tidal volume wouldn't change. So for a first part of it until I get past that time constants, if I increase it even more, my tidal volume won't change. It'll stay the same, all right? So if I just went up to say 1.1 second or 1.2 seconds, the tidal volume would keep going up because I'm not truncating it off. So I know that's a difficult concept, but Walking at these two diagrams, I hope you can see that. And if you actually played with this in virtual ventilators, you'd see by increasing the TI, eventually right here, you'd see that the vo tidal volumes would go up. All right? So what factors affect tidal volume during the mode of pressure control breaths? Well, clearly the compliance of the patient and the delta P established by the ventilator. And it's whether or not we've allowed enough time for equilibrium to be occurring. All right? So that's an important part about this. We've got to consider both the compliance of the, I'll write that here, the compliance of the patient's lungs, the pressure control or the change in pressure, all right, so that's both PEEP and the pressure control level are important to that. But also the TI is important because if it's not greater than five times the time constant, that could be a limiting factor, all right? So the compliance of the patient is a huge portion of the amount of pressure that's going to go in the in the lungs and we establish that with our delta p all right we establish exactly how much pressure but it's the compliance that determines what the tidal volume is going to be all right so you really want to know this equation so for an example if i gave you a patient's compliance say 25 mils per centimeter of water all right and I told you that I wanted to set up a pressure control level of, say, I don't know, 25 with a PEEP of 5. All right, so this is the maximal pressure in the lungs. So that's going to give me a delta P of 20. Could you calculate the tidal volume? Well, in this equation, clearly you would be able to. All right. So remember that though the delta P is changing in the pressure, it depends on equilibrium occurring. So we got to make sure that we have enough TI for equilibrium to occur, or that could be a limiting factor. If a, special, if a pressure equilibrium doesn't occur, this results in a smaller tidal volume than expected. And in fact, we won't even know how much pressure is going into the lungs 
I know the slide's getting a little busy, but you can read your own as you've got them printed off in front of you. Remember, factors that affect equilibrium are not adjust the resistance and compliance only. All right. All right. So what factors affect the inspiratory flow? All right. Well, clearly, I'll just show you. Um, the inspiratory flow is controlled, in fact, by the lung characteristics. All right. And that comes back to that time constant again. When we have a large pressure gradient between the, uh, the mouth pressure and the pressure in the lungs, we're going to have flow. All right, so flow will, flow will occur. And then as the pressure gradient gets closer and closer, flow will decline. All right, so initially we have a very high pressure gradient. And the, then as the pressure gradient gets closer and closer, as the lungs start to fill, this um, the flow will naturally decline. So in the mode of pressure control, we get this naturally decelerating flow waveform. And that is controlled by the lung characteristics of compliance and resistance. Okay, wow, that's a lot to talk about. All right, here's just another example of how um, compliance can change and how your lung characteristics can change the tidal volume being delivered to the patient. All right, so it's a complex relationship here. I've still got the pressure control level set at 25 on both of these. I've got the TI set at the same. All right, all the other factors are the same, but this patient has a lung compliance of 40 and this has a, has a greater lung compliance of 80. All right, so clearly we're gonna get more tidal volume and in fact we do, we get 956 compared to the 800. But you know what else is occurring here? We've got our truncation of inspiratory flow. So we haven't optimized because, of course, the compliance or resistance is different in this lung. We're getting larger tidal volumes. It's going to take longer to put it in. And we haven't comp um, compensated for that with our TI. So we've truncated the inspiratory flow. So that's a limiting factor in tidal volume delivery. Well, let's look at this another set of lungs here. This is the exact same situation before. This is a repeat of that same slide just for comparison. All right. So here we've got um, our pressure control level 25. We've got a compliance at 80. So we've got truncation of inspiratory flow. All right. And we've got this tidal volume being delivered. So what's happened in this next one here is I've just increased the TI. All right. And when you do that, sorry about the pen messing up there. But when you increase the TI, we're going to optimize the tidal volume delivery. And note what I've got down here. I've got a good inspiratory pause occurring. All right. And look at what the optimal tidal volume is. For this delta P, we're getting a tidal volume of a 1,000 or 1, yeah, 1,025 mils. All right. And all we did was we gave a little more time for equilibrium to occur between mouth pressures and lung pressures. Well, I know I'm saying a lot here, but I hope with the video you can scrub back and forth and think about what I'm saying, all right? So, the time constant controls the inspiratory flow rate. And that's an important concept. And what controls the time constant? It's the resistance and compliance of the lungs. Now, the resistance doesn't change that much because that is really the endotracheal tube, all right? There's a little bit of lower lung resistance, but in fact, it's not very much. Most of this is due to the endotracheal tube. So it's the compliance of the lung that changes. And we know that different disease factors can cause quite a variety of, of compliance changes within the lungs. And unfortunately, it's not evenly distributed throughout the lungs. A lot of lung diseases are regional or only affect certain areas of the lungs. So other areas of the lungs are healthy. That's why we need this pressure control or this lung protective strategy to protect the healthy areas of the lungs. Okay, so these factors contribute to both inspiratory and expiratory flow rates. Right. Okay, so this is the end of our discussion about pressure control. And uh, you can review this video, and I've also got a demonstration on the, um, uh, demonstrating the mode in another video on an actual ventilator. Thank you very much.